Hello everyone, my name is Bruno Odizio. I'm an intervention radiologist from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And the title of my presentation today uh, will be about the use of liver ablation, chemo embolization for the treatment of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So before we dig into the, uh, uh, the two modalities we're gonna to discuss today, I just wanna draw a parallel here between a paracellular carcinoma and a, a intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma in regards to the use of local regional therapies. Uh, this is a Japanese survey from 2016. As you can see here, ablation and chemo embolization uh, combined they are utilizing approximately 60% of the patients uh, with a paracellular carcinoma. Whereas if you take in consideration uh, and compare with uh, intrapatic cholangiocarcinoma, uh, the number of patients who have uh, uh, such local regional therapies are significantly lower. And the reason for that, as I'm gonna try to explain uh, following uh, this presentation, is the, the fact that many of those patients they present with a very advanced uh, disease course. And uh, up to this day, there is no clear definition when we should use one local regional therapy versus the other uh, in the setting of uh, intrapatic cholangiocarcinoma. So let's talk about ablation, uh, liver ablation for cholangiocarcinoma, or in general, uh, the, the concept of ablation is you're delivering a cytotoxic agent. It can be a chemical such as alcohol, a thermal ablation such as radiofrequency ablation, microwave, or uh, electrical uh, energy such as uh, irreversible electroporation. Uh, you're delivering that via an applicator, which is usually a needle, uh, placed within the tumor, and you use some sort of imaging guidance to do that. You can use a CT scan or ultrasound scan or MRI uh, uh, to uh, place the probe, the needle, uh, within the tumor and therefore uh, deliver the treatment. So when we uh, apply ablation, we have uh, the, the idea of uh, creating this coagulative necrosis uh, on the tumor, and with that, Every time we apply ablation, uh, we want to uh, apply a local therapy that is curative intent. So it's a local modality that our bar is extremely high. We want to get complete coverage, complete uh, 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 necrosis of the tumor, uh, similar to surgery. We want to get uh, what we call A0 ablation uh, in parallel to what they call R0 resection in the surgical literature. This is different from, for instance, chemo embolization or radio embolization with atrium 90, where you are looking for objective response and objective response can be either complete response, uh, complete tumor destruction or partial response. Uh, for ablation, we always looking to complete response. That's our ultimate goal. Uh, you know, in, in, in daily clinical practice, uh, presently, the way we are uh, uh, perform liver ablation, uh, we use thermal modalities such as radio frequency ablation, microwave ablation as the ablation modalities of choice. And the reason for that is we have more data associated with uh, those modalities. And therefore, uh, it's also easier to reproduce the results because the, those are the two modalities that we have the highest uh, 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 experience with. Uh, we always try to use some sort of uh, imaging guidance when we do ablation, it can be CT or ultrasound. Here in the Western world, in general, CT is a modality, uh, imaging modality of choice for ablation because it, that allows us to do a 3D ablation margin monitoring and, and assessment as we uh, the, deliver the ablation. We know that uh, uh, achieving adequate margins is absolutely uh, important when we do uh, uh, such procedure. So uh, in regards to patients with uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, uh, the use of ablation uh, up to this day is limited in terms of data because, again, many of those patients, unfortunately, they present with uh, advanced disease and uh, ablation cannot really properly uh, uh, apply for those patients. And because of this lack of data, uh, most of the uh, uh, guidelines, they acknowledge uh, ablation as a palliative procedure instead of a curative procedure such as uh, on the hepatocellular carcinoma guideline. So I think this is basically uh, due to the fact that we don't have enough data uh, on cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, typically, we reserve uh, uh, ablation for patients who are deemed unresectable and who have small and localized tumors. And what I say by small is measuring up to three centimeters and usually a maximum number of tumors between three to five. Uh, the, the issue about having extra hepatic disease or not uh, in regards to the ablation uh, indication. It's not very clear on the literature. 
uh, I would say that in our institution, we do apply liver ablation for patients with uh, extra hepatic metastasis because we believe that the uh, uh, liver tumors are uh, the tumors that usually drive uh, the outcomes of those patients. And that's why trying to control those tumors would be uh, uh, the, the ideal situation, even the setting of extra, extra hepatic uh, disease. So this is a typical patient that we do an ablation. This patient had a, a solitary tumor measuring about 2.2 centimeters on the right hepatic lobe, as you can see on this MRI uh, exam there. Uh, we performed the ablation. This is the first CT scan after uh, uh, ablation. And you no longer uh, can really see the tumor. All you can see maybe is whatever was left on the tumor here. And you see this big cavity. This is an, uh, the, the coagulative uh, necrosis uh, that we generate with ablation. And uh, this patient has been uh, uh, without any recurrence and uh, NED for the last 41 months uh, since the ablation. In regards to data, uh, post-resection recurrence is the uh, main uh, 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 clinical situation where you see data uh, uh, on the literature. This is a paper uh, published by Zeng in 2013, where they compare patients who underwent ablation after post-resection recurrence, 77 patients versus patients who had repeated uh, resection, 32 patients. And they show on this uh, retrospective analysis that there was no difference in overall uh, disease-free survival and also overall survival, overall survival for the patient undergoing recession was 20.3 months, for the patient undergoing uh, uh, ablation, 21.3 months. So not significant difference in overall survival. Uh, major complications were significantly lower towards the ablation group. And uh, uh, based on those two variables, uh, they recommend uh, uh, ablation as the local modality of choice for patients with tumors uh, measuring uh, up to three centimeters in size, uh, who present with such tumors after uh, hepatic recurrence. One important thing uh, about this uh, data is that they show that patients who have a subset of patients who had uh, tumors measuring more than three centimeters in diameter, uh, repeating resection improved outcomes compared to ablation. So their overall conclusion is if you have a tumor after initial resection, and that tumor measure up to three centimeters ablation should be the first uh, 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 local modality uh, for treating uh, such tumor. If the lesion is measuring more than three centimeters in size, you should go to re resection. Uh, in regards uh, different you know, ablation technologies, radio frequency ablation uh, is the most widely utilized uh, ablation modality in the world. There is a systematic review. Uh, meta-analysis of 84 patients that uh, were included uh, that show a pulled local recurrence rate of 21 percent. Uh, local recurrence rate on the ablation literature is also called a local tumor progression. And as you can see here, you had a local recurrence rate as low as 8 percent, as high as 50 percent. So there's a lot of uh, 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 you know, variables in terms of uh, success that might be attributed to patient selection, but also with the technique apply uh, by the intervention radiology. So uh, I would say that the goal is to perform ablations where you can get local tumor progression rates of uh, maximum of 10 to 15%. Uh, pull at one to three, five years survival rates uh, on these uh, meta-analysis 82, 47, 24%. Uh, respectively. Uh, in terms of microwave ablation, which is our thermal modality of choice that we use uh, over 95% of our patients here on MD Anderson, uh, the largest series to date, it's a series, uh, again, from Zeng, 107 patients uh, with 171 cholangiocarcinomas uh, treated, uh, medium progression free survival of 8.7 months. Most of those patients, they uh, progress with new tumors within their liver, not necessarily on the tumors that were ablated. Uh, overall survival, one, three, and five years of 93.5, 39.6, and 7.9%. This is our most institutional analysis. We got uh, the MDA Anderson ablation data with two institutions in Italy, and we combined it 46 patients uh, who underwent 65 ablations, uh, 65 college carcinomas uh, who were treated with ablation. Uh, our three-year local tumor progression free survival, which means local recurrence free survival, 71.5%. Uh, Median intrapatic progression free survival, six months. Again, most of those patients, they recur with new tumors on the liver rather than the tumors that we treated. Uh, median overall survival, 34.5 months. 
uh, we had a next generation uh, sequencing uh, available for 18 patients of those 46 that we analyzed. And we took a look to see what is the kind of genetic alterations. They have uh, FGFR uh, was present in uh, about 16% of the patients, which is kind of in keeping uh, with the reported uh, numbers in the literature, which is around 25%, providing uh, the small number of patients that we analyze. Uh, in terms of complications, uh, major complications after ablation, they are very low uh, 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 presently. Uh, the most concerning complications would be abscess. Uh, this is a, a situation having abscess tends to happen more frequently on patients who have biliary manipulation, who have a biliary stent or biliary catheter, and we try to uh, minimize the chance of having such complication, uh, giving uh, an aggress aggressive uh, prophylactic antibiotic regimen. Uh, we can also, uh, given the thermal damage, we can create some uh, biliary damage associated with the uh, ablation application and bleeding as well. Uh, post ablation syndrome is not necessarily considered a complication. Uh, up to 80% of the patients, they uh, develop that, which means they have uh, low-grade fever, some pain, some nausea, and uh, the vast majority of those patients, we just uh, 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 can manage that on an outpatient setting. We give some pain medication, some, some uh, anti-nausea medication, and they can take that with them to their home and they tend to be fine with that. Uh, this is one particular application of ablation. This patient uh, had a uh, left hepatectomy and had a central recurrence, uh, show right here, approximately two centimeter tumor, very close to the main bio ducts and the main uh, uh, hepatic vessels. So uh, we could not do safely a uh, thermal ablation for this patient. So what we use is re irreversible electroporation, which is a nice application. Uh, on these uh, uh, kind of central located lesions. Uh, this is the immediate uh, CT scan after the uh, irreversible operation where you can see the cavity of the ablation. And uh, this is uh, 15 months later showing no local adherence. Uh, there is some atrophy of the right posterior sector uh, due to the ablation, but the patient did not show any signs of uh, adherence. So in regards to chemo embolization, chemo embolization, uh, we are delivering a cytotoxic material via the hepatic artery. The, the rationale behind of this therapy is that the, uh, uh, the, if you have a tumor in the liver, uh, especially a primary liver cancer, most of the blood supply to that tumor will come from the hepatic artery instead of the portal vein. And if you deliver something from the hepatic artery, yeah, that's going to go preferentially to the tumor instead of to the normal liver. There are essentially two methods that we do chemoembolization traditionally. Uh, one of them is the pyodaltase, which is called a conventional taste, where we use an oil-based contrast agent uh, mixed with a chemotherapy and an embolic agent. This is the uh, you know, most widely utilized uh, chemoembolic uh, regimen uh, to this date. Uh, and uh, more recently, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, we started using drug eluting beads with uh, 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 chemoembolization, which means you have those small calibrated microspheres that you can elute with a, a chemotherapy. And uh, the, the, the goal of doing that is you can give a calibrated dose of chemotherapy uh, uh, to the tumors. Uh, and we, we believe the, there is a higher standardization when drug eluting beads are, are applied. So patient selection to go uh, to chemoembolization, those patients, they need to have preserved hepatic function, uh, child plug score, AOB, uh, appropriate performance status between zero up to two, so very similar to uh, selection criteria for hepatocellular carcinoma patients. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that we do here on MD Anderson. Typically, the patients that we treat with chemoembolization are those patients who are ineligible for ablation, external beam radiation, or Y90 radioembolization. Uh, this is just our preference in our institution here. So this is the typical uh, uh, patient who receives chemoembolization in our institution. The patient had external beam radiation to a large central tumor, uh, had a really nice response to radiation, but unfortunately developed some tumors. Uh, uh, on the left hepatic lobe and some recurrence on the margin of the ablation he was, of the radiation. The patient was re-irradiated and on top of that received chemoembolization, uh, three cycles of chemoembolization. And that provided control uh, of the tumor along with the external beam radiation. Uh, this is uh, 
in the last CT scan before the patient received a liver transplant after documenting disease stability for several months. Uh, if we take a look on the literature, the, the, the challenge is interpreting the data is there are a number of different uh, chemo, uh, uh, therapeutic uh, regimens utilized uh, for chemoembolization. Uh, the survival, uh, median survival of chemoembolization ranges from as low as 11 to as high as uh, 25 months. But as you can see here, uh, uh, those reports, they have different uh, 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 patients in terms of uh, tumor burden, uh, number of lesions, uh, technical success, and uh, response rates. So it's very hard to interpret the data uh, on this scenario. Same thing with drug loading beads. Uh, we have less reports on the literature because it's a newer technology, uh, but the challenges in respect to uh, uh, technique standardization, they remain uh, even with drug loading beads. So I think the most definitive data that we have to this uh, present moment uh, is this meta-analysis of 542 patients that was uh, published by Ray et al. In, at the JVIR 2013. Uh, they show a cum cumulative median viral survival of 13.4 months, objective response rate of approximately 77%, which is really good, and one-year overall survival uh, rate of approximately 58%. Uh, major complications, uh, CTCA, uh, three or more, were reported 18.9% uh, of the patients. I want to uh, draw a parallel here with Y90. Y90 tends to be much uh, well tolerated than uh, chemoembolization in general for those patients. And usually this is a, a, one of the variables that the physicians uh, 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 make a decision towards Y90 versus uh, chemoembolization. Uh, we believe the patients, they do better uh, on the first two weeks after chemoembolization. Uh, nevertheless, despite of the you know, higher rate of post-embolization syndrome and complications uh, with chemoembolization, one thing that we need to factor is the cost. Cost of with Y90 is significantly higher than chemoembolization. Uh, so in conclusions, ablation, uh, we have limited data available just because of the nature of the disease which uh, uh, we are examining here. Uh, but if we uh, take a, a, a careful look on the data available, we can say that the outcomes are very much in par uh, with surgical resection for those patients who have post resection recurrence with small tumors. Uh, the, the, the outcomes are also very similar to the ablation uh, that we apply routinely in, in other uh, histologies, such as colorectal liver meds or hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, where ablation is considered a curative intent therapy. Uh, we have low complication rates with ablation and fast recovery when we compare to surgical resection, and that's a great appeal uh, to apply ablation for those patients. Uh, chemoembolization, we know that uh, applying chemoembolization based on the data we have improved the outcomes versus best supportive care, but the lack of technique and standardization uh, limits the data interpretation. Again, in our institution, we try to uh, reserve chemoembolization for patients who cannot receive other local regional therapies uh, or who receive local regional therapies in the past and they are progressing uh, with new sites of disease or recurrence and we need to treat them in a safe manner. Uh, that's my contact information. Thanks so much for uh, your time and attention.